Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March edition of our webinar series here at William Selium. Uh, my name is Carly Dupuy, lead tasting salon host here at William Selium, and I want to extend the warmest of welcomes to everyone joining us uh, all across the country. If you wouldn't mind letting us know what's in your glass tonight and, and where you're from, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. Uh, and as a reminder, if you if this is your first webinar, feel free to ask any questions in the chat as well. We're, we we have folks who will be happy to answer those, uh, whether it be through our Q&A session at the end uh, or, or via the chat. So fire away with all of your questions. We're really excited to introduce a, an exciting topic tonight on the Cytone Vineyard. Um, and to start things off, I wanted to uh, ask a little trivia question this time. And uh, the winner of this trivia question will actually be receiving a William Selium corkscrew, uh, which is very exciting. So if you know the answer to this question, go ahead and put it in the chat and uh, good luck. The question is, what was the original name of William Selium? It was on the original label. So I'll let you folks uh, ponder that a little bit while I introduce uh, a few of my colleagues who will be joining me today. Um, I'm actually here in the room with uh, winemaker Jeff Mangahoss, which is very exciting because we've been, uh, we've been at least two weeks past our, our second vaccine. Uh, so the light at the, the end of the tunnel is growing near. So I, I wanted to introduce Jeff. How's it going guys? Nice to be here. Look forward to tasting. So yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> and I also wanted to introduce uh, my counterpart here at William Selium, Sandrew Montgomery, who is our other lead tasting salon host. Welcome Sandrew. Hey. Welcome everybody. Nice to have you back with us. So glad you're here. Cheers. Thanks so much. And I also wanted to welcome in Mark Malpiti, uh, Director of Sales here at William Selium. Welcome back, Mark. Perfect. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, this really exciting topic, Cytone Vineyard. I'm going to let Sandrew take it away with a little bit of the, the history behind this exquisite vineyard. Uh, so Sandrew, take it away. Okay, Carly, thank you. And uh, Nice to have you guys with us today. I want to tell you a little bit about the Cytone Ranch. Um, we do an experience out there, and if you've been here to the William Selium Estate, you know it's an ultra-modern building, but well, we have the antithesis going on at the Cytone Ranch, which was established in 1895 by Maria and Antonio Cytone, and they immigrated in from Genoa, Italy. So uh, the Cytone Estate was a 640-acre parcel. Today, it's 37 acres, 33 of which are planted to a variety of different grapes. So you can make those classic Italian field blends. Um, they actually, the vines were planted in 1898. So those are those big old gnarly suckers. And uh, there you go. There's a great shot of them right there. And they still yield beautiful fruit as we're going to be tasting through today. And uh, our owner, John Dyson, purchased the property in 2016, uh, right in the heart of the Russian River. Well, most of you are familiar with Olivet Lane, so this is right on Olivet Road. In fact, uh, Olivet Lane was part of that 640-acre parcel. Now, today, it's one of the few remaining oldest old vine vineyards in Sonoma County, which I believe that makes it in California as well. Um, <clears throat> but back in the day, not only were there grapes planted there, but there were also pear, apple, and plum orchards. While in the meantime, roaming around the ranch were cows, chickens, pigs, horses, sheep, goats, pretty much you name it, that homestead was very much uh, self-serving. So, um, it's totally a working ranch, and we've restored that to some large degree. Uh, so we'd love to have you come out and join us, take you out into the vineyards. Uh, we'll show you what's being or what has been planted there, and uh, then we'll bring you around back. We've actually set up a nice little museum there with the uh, turn-of-the-century farm equipment. There is the Cytone Vineyard Barn right there, and... Um, Mark is going to take us through a little bit more of this. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, when William Selliam and John Dyson bought, uh, bought the Cytone Ranch, and probably when it started in 1895, it was the Cytone Ranch, um, 
he, the idea was there are these landmark heritage vineyards out there planted in the late 1800s that were all being torn up and planted over to Pinot Noir. And so he wanted to preserve these historic vines and this property and keep it as old vines Zinfandel. Um, but you know, there's this old barn there and John decided that the best way he could honor the history and the family um, that we bought it from, because we bought it from the descendants of Maria and Antonio Saiton, was to restore the barn to the way it would have been had, were we in the you know, early 1900s before you had you know, uh, modern day farming. So he got uh, these uh, artisan restoration folks to come in and do an authentic restoration. And that means instead of replacing the old barn wood uh, where there was a hole, they would use a tin can or an old license plate. And uh, that was the way it had been done. That's the way it, the barn was repaired, but they just updated that a little bit and uh, brought it back to its original uh, state as a working barn. And so uh, through the process of this, we chronicled it in a video and we'd like to show you that video and uh, it will show you a little more about the history of it, the history of farming uh, at the turn of the century and a little bit more about the property. And so uh, John Dyson tells the story mostly in his own words. So uh, Scott, if you'd fire up the video, we can all take a look at it. So this is the original Cytone barn. We'll come back and take a look, but it's full of the equipment to show how they cultivated these vines planted in 1895. This used to be what Sonoma County did, Zinfandel. It is astonishing that it's still here. It's one of the largest of the original plantings left in the state of California. Turns out our vineyard manager, Chris Bolin, had heard that the family had decided maybe they would like to sell this vineyard, but they were worried that if they didn't find the right buyer, like many of the other old vines and Fidel vineyards, they would be bulldozed out and in would come more Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. So I undertook two years of romancing, taking them over to our winery, showing them the old vines in we made from the neighbor down the road, Apera, and proving to them that we were the right stewards to carry on this old vine Zinfandel history and to preserve what had been here through three generations of their family. I consider it an existential experience, this stuff. I mean, here it is, all by itself, 100 years old, growing on their own, no irrigation, a little cultivating back and forth with the horse, growing uh, a wonderful crop, and here they are, 30 acres. We were so lucky to be able to preserve it. The Italians and the French who came to the United States brought with them in their suitcase on the ship the vines they thought would grow well in California climate. All this cultivation was done by horses. It's astonishing the amount of work that went into making wine in those days. We think we work hard, nothing like the way they worked. <laughs> All the old barns, of course, this is redwood, so it had knots, had holes. So the old farmers always took a tin can or some old piece of metal they had lying around. Sometimes an old license plate did fine. So from 1895, to 1940, this was how they did it. So we've restored this barn to demonstrate the process that they used. So you can imagine, this is the first step of cultivating the vineyard. The farmer is going along holding this plow. People will say, oh, well, the horse had to do so much work. The farmer was walking the same number of miles as the horse in those days. Then years later, a very smart man who made a fortune decided, well, why don't we invent something 
where the farmer doesn't have to walk. And so now we have a seat. And the farmer, now lucky man, he sits on the seat and he's no longer walking. So you can imagine that these, once they were invented, sold very briskly. <laughs> Major improvement. With some luck, we have succeeded in cultivating a good crop. So the farmer would go along, cut the grapes, and put them into redwood picking boxes. These went in a wagon like this to some local winery, or they made it themselves. Then we put it in a crusher. Farmer cranks down this. With more and more pressure, the juice is coming out and coming into a vessel like this made out of copper because it would not affect the taste of the wine. New wine goes into a barrel for aging. And we're pouring it into this wonderful old barrel. We age it maybe for a year. Now comes the important part. We pour the new wine into this bottle. This device here squeezes the cork into the bottle. So this is an old bottle of the, of the era with this handmade rattan work around it so that the bottle wouldn't break. Bottles were expensive. Here is a version from about 1920, and this is the modern William Selium version. Same grapes. We replaced the horse with the tractor. We have very much the same equipment, and we still pick by hand. We are very happy to be able to preserve this little piece of Sonoma history, the history of the Italian immigrants, and the history of Zinfandel as a grape, and as a wine, of course. All right. That was a fascinating video to watch. Um, so different today than, uh, than it was back then, and, and thankfully so. I mean, we have stainless steel and all these um, incredible things to, to make uh, the winemaking process and the farming process uh, easier. Um, yeah, uh, let's jump into tasting. Uh, we got a couple of really exciting wines, uh, a couple of new wines that, that we want to introduce. Um, we're going to start out with the uh, Maria's uh, Field Blend, uh, so named after the matriarch of, uh, of the Cytone family. Um, this is kind of an interesting uh, blend. So it's, it's a field blend of a bunch of different white grapes uh, that are sort of interplanted in the, the Zinfandel fields. Uh, primarily, there's Palomino, uh, Muscadel, and a tiny little bit of Muscat. Um, and I do, uh, you know, we owe a little bit of uh, credit to uh, Mike Officer over at Carlisle that helped identify uh, a lot of these grape varieties. And it's this fascinating process uh, called ampelography that you can identify based on the leaf structure uh, of the, the, the vine itself and looking at the clusters. And you can actually identify... Uh, the variety. I mean, today we would do it by DNA um, signature, uh, but back, you know, even a few years ago, that wasn't widely available. So uh, thanks to Mike for for helping uh, identify a lot of these. Um, he's very skilled at it. Um, really fascinating wine. Um, uh, we whole cluster press it like we would any other white wine at uh, William Selium, uh, picked at night, uh, gently pressed to a tank, uh, settled, and then pretty much goes straight to, to barrel. Um, I use an interesting, a different type of barrel for this, uh, sort of been experimenting. The 2019 that we're tasting is a, a sort of a open book, you know, just trying to figure out uh, best practices. Uh, so I started to use, um, even a few years ago, started experimenting with the Gruner, um, these, what's called a demi moed which is a 600 liter barrel. So that holds about a little over two and a half regular barrels uh, worth of wine in this demi mouid. Uh, so it's slowly fermented, cold temperatures uh, after pressing in these demi mouids. Um, and what, what I like about that is the, the demi mouids have a little thicker stave, uh, so it kind of protects the wine a little bit better from oxidation, a slower sort of aging process. Um, and I think when you, all right, when you come and taste this wine, it's got this beautiful perfume to it, right? I mean, it's 
partly the muscadel and muscat, and there's the, the aromas of you know the palomino, very uh, um, uh, very floral in nature. Um, and there's no oak signature whatsoever to me. It's just the spiciness of uh, of the grape uh, varieties. Um, in the mouth, I mean these these grapes are typically a little lower acid. Um, you know, I, I tend to think of the Cytone Ranch as a, a higher acid site, just the nature of where um, the Cytone Vineyard is in the Russian River Valley, cold nights, it really preserves some of the acidity. So there's some nice freshness to this. Um, Mark, what do you think? I mean, it's got some, you know, bright fruit character to it, but it's very silky and round at the same time. Yeah, I mean, the, the roundness is what I keyed on because, you know, um, like a couple of our other winery only wines that you taste when you come and visit, um, it, the Chenin Blanc has real high acidity. Yeah. And this to me is a counterpart to that where, you know, it definitely has acidity and structure, but you get that the roundness more. And I know that these varieties aren't in this wine, but more along the lines of like a Roussan Marsan Viognier yeah. than Chenin Blanc Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, partly I think these varieties not really having worked with them before, um, you know, thick skins that there's a structure, I think, associated with with, with those varieties. Um, and it just, yeah, it gives sort of a, it's a mouth feeling, you know, filling experience. Um, very, very interesting wine. Um, you know, I love the nose. It's got the floral, you know, kind of peach blossoms. Um, pear, quince, you know, some of those really interesting um, uh, mixture of aromas. Um, this the wine um, is, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's aged like we would uh, uh, any of our barrel fermented Chardonnays on the lees. We stir it to help, you know, give it structure and weight. So taking a lot of what we know works, that works really well with barrel fermented wines, uh, white wines, you know, we practice those techniques here. So. Yeah. Sandra, what do you think of it? Well, I agree with you both, um, especially on the Marsan. The first time I tried this wine, it definitely reminded me of that Rhone White. Um, yeah. Love the beautiful aromatics. It just, it's just, it's mind boggling actually. So the other night I actually tried this with its uh, richness and I did a uh, shrimp scampi and uh, put in some tomatoes to pump up the acid a little bit along with the pasta and the richness of the wine and the richness of the Reggiano Parmigino, just beautiful match. Very cool. simple. Yeah. 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 No, oh, awesome. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how this wine ages. I think, you know, because it is on the lower acid side, I think it'll still age well because of the kind of the sneaky tannins behind it. There's a lot of structure, I think, kind of lurking in the background. So I think it should age pretty well. Um, great. Uh, let's move on to, so that was the Maria's. Uh, another wine that we've introduced with the 19 vintage is the Antonio's uh, Field Blend. Um, this is a, another interesting wine. So, I mean, we, we introduced the, the uh, Zinfandel in 2016 um, and in 2019, the, the Antonio's. Um, this is a Field Blend uh, as well. It's got uh, a bunch of different uh, varieties. Um, Alicante, uh, Boucher, uh, Grand Noir, um, and of course there's a little bit of Zinfandel and Carignan uh, in this part of the ranch. Uh, there's a section, a particular section of the ranch where these um, uh, these varieties are concentrated. Um, and typically in other field blended vineyards, a lot of those other varieties would just be scattered throughout the, throughout the vineyard. But for whatever reason, they were planted uh, more uh, in, a, in a specific area in the vineyard. Um, and interestingly enough, a couple of these varieties, the Alicante and the Grand Noir in particular, are very unique because um, the, the skin is red, of course, because it's a red variety, but the juice is also red. It's very interesting. Most other red grapes, red varieties, the juice is clear. And then throughout the winemaking process, the wine becomes red as it extracts the, the color compounds from the yeah. skin. Um, so yeah, it's a, the Alicante and the Grand Noir. If you're, um, you know, if you ever get a chance to look at the, 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 the grape itself, it just bleeds red. Um, and looking at this wine, it has an incredible amount of color to it. It's very dense, very dark. Um, 
here, you know, with, with, with our expertise in Zinfandel, you know, we practice a lot of the same sort of winemaking techniques there. Everything's de-stemmed uh, fruit like we would with, with, a, with a Zinfandel. Sometimes the, 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 uh, uh, the rachis, the stems are a little on the green side uh, in Zinfandel and some of these other varieties. So we don't want to include those in the winemaking process. Um, they're all fermented in our dairy tanks, uh, just like our uh, Zinfandel and, of course, our Pinot Noirs uh, as well. Um, terrific nose, right, on this, guys? I mean, what do you, what do you think? What do you yeah. smell, Sandra? Well, um, as I was mentioning to both of you earlier, I, I've noticed since we first tried this wine just three weeks ago, it's really had a chance uh, to open up to some degree. I mean, it's still a very tight wine. It's a young wine. But yeah. uh, it's already starting to show some evolution. Uh, the tannins are really well integrated. Um, in terms of the nose, getting a, a little cardamom and um, kind of carnation rose kind of a thing going on. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's that nice floral character. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very unusual. Yeah, with this one, I would uh, just keep it simple again and go with a, a classic margarita pizza. So you've got the tomato sauce, you have the buffalo de mozzarella, and um, and fresh basil. And that'll bring up some more of those aromatics. So great yeah. job. Yeah. The color, oh man. Oh, the color is just, it's so alluring and, and it almost has an electric sort of look to it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. uh, along with, you know, those grape varieties, the Alicante and the, uh, the Grand Noir, I mean, not only the the color, but typically these varieties have a lot of tannin in them. So, kind of you know, looking at the world, uh, winemaking world through William Selliam's eyes, you know, we're looking at it with um, you know, sort of a Pinot Noir, looking at it through a Pinot Noir lens. So, you know, the gentleness in which we make wine, the foot treading, the dairy tanks, all those wonderful techniques that are great for Pinot Noir are great for varieties like this that can be overpowering and tannic. So I think even though this wine has an incredible amount of structure, it is quite elegant, you know, for what it is, or, you know, it, it can definitely go in a different direction if it wasn't um, so thoughtfully made. Jeff, what would you compare this wine to stylistically? Because it, it doesn't taste like any other William Selliam I've ever had. You know, because yeah. obviously it's not a Zin. We don't make Syrah. Like, where, where would this fit in on a comparative spectrum? Oh, gosh. I mean, I've had the fortunate opportunity to taste other pure uh, Alicante um, bottlings, and it would definitely be in that sort of category. I mean, going through, in, in my head, other varieties that I've had um, kind of up in, um, uh, it's a variety called Lagrain, uh, Lagrain, Lagrain. Uh, up in kind of the northern part of um, Italy, uh, the Alto Adige area. I mean, the wines have this sort of density and richness. Um, but I mean, to me, it's quite unique, you know, in general, because it has, I mean, it has some Zinfandel sort of qualities to it. And I think in its aromas, the dark fruits, that kind of thing, but very powerful on the palate. Um, it, it's uniquely Cytone, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. So I wanted to take a step back um, and we'll, we'll throw it back to Carly for a second. Uh, but uh, we didn't, I don't think we did a proper job of introducing these wines. Um, so the, uh, the two blends are both field blends. The white blend was Maria's white field blend. Because it's a blend, we can't call it a single grape. So we're just calling it a white field blend and Antonio's Red Field Blend, and they're named after the matriarch and patriarch of the Cytone family that, as Sandra explained, first uh, started the ranch in uh, 1895. And we don't put these wines on the allocation. They're available when you come and visit us. And if you come, especially if you come and uh, do the Cytone tour, which is about 15, if you've been to the winery before, it's about 15 minutes away. And it's a completely different experience of being out in the vineyard. Um, so these are both brand new wines. We're introducing them tonight. Um, and hopefully in the years to come when you visit, you'll be able to try, if not the 2019, which we're, we have in our glasses, but uh, future uh, versions of this down the road. So, yeah. um, Carly? Well, 
Oh, sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to step on you there. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we're going to jump into a little bit of a, a break in the action with some rapid fire hot seat questions. But before I do that, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Stephen Rose and Marie Jackson on YouTube and Matthew Hartman on Facebook. Congratulations on winning the trivia. Uh, you should be glad that Jeff didn't ask you what uh, the red red bleeding grapes are, the Tantulia grapes. Mm -hmm. That was thrown out there and that's that's uh, quite difficult. So the answer to the trivia question is Hacienda del Rio. That was the original name of William Selyam uh, prior to William Selyam. Uh, and thank you, Sandra, for showing that bottle. It's it's neat to see he that even though right. the name was slightly different, uh, we still kept the that same label, that classic, classic look. So this month for our hot seat questions, we wanted to allow you folks a chance to get to know us a little bit better. So we're actually gonna be featuring a, a new person every time for the hot seat. So last time we had uh, Jeff, in the hot seat. This time we're going to have Mark in the hot seat. So Mark, are you ready? As, as ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So let's start off with uh, one of my favorite questions. What is your favorite clone of Pinot Noir? Okay, I'm going to I'm going to do a cop out answer then and an answer. I actually prefer a, a blend of clones in Pinot Noir because I think there's I've, I've certainly had good versions of Pinot Noirs that are monoclones, including our Luella's, which is uh, our Luella's garden, which was, uh, all, which is all Calera. But if I, if I had to pick a single clone, it would be one of the, what we call heritage clones, um, which I believe, and, and Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, were originally um, in the Pomard family of clones, but we call them uh, Swan, Mount Eden Martini, um, but I tend to like wines that have the Swan clone in it uh, the most. Quite the diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. What is your favorite non-wine beverage? Oh, tea, without tea. a doubt. Um, Any preference, green, black, herbal? Uh, green, well, okay, uh, black in the morning okay. and uh, herbal after that. Nice, very good. Uh, what is your favorite William Selium wine? Which which uh, bottling is your absolute favorite? Pinot, uh, year in and year out, the Allen Vineyard tends to be my favorite, um, or in my top three. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the estate wines, um, mass selection especially. But if I were forced to pick on, uh, it would be the the Allen. On the white wines, I I love our Chenin Blanc. Um, in the Chardonnays, um, lately three sisters. And so I keep on naming the wines that aren't on the allocation, um, which is, you know, but you, yeah, I'm on the hot seat, so I'm giving you my honest answer. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. Uh, those of you who have not been to the estate yet to try any of the uh, winery only wines, this just means you'll have to come out and, uh, and uh, see us when you're in, in, in wine country. Mm -hmm. uh, so opposite side of that question, what is your favorite non-William Selium wine? Hmm. Um, I've been, I've been experimenting in the Northern Rhone lately um, and trying uh, a lot of different things there. You know, I mean, we're, where we live here in Sonoma County, we are so exposed to Pinot Noir and I'm such a big Pinot Noir fan that I, I have lots of favorites among our community, but, you know, probably right now, um, Northern Rhone, and also um, uh, Chablis and Sauvignon as well. So I've been I've been spending more time on the international wines, more so for education, um, uh, just because I I do get tend to be a little too narrow living here in Sonoma County. So I've been trying to force myself out of my comfort zone. It's a great idea. I'm a firm believer in uh, not getting a, a house palette, if you will. You know, always, always exposing yourself to new things. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, one more question. Who is the most interesting person in wine that you've met? Um, well, I met him at the very end of his life, a couple of months before he died, but I did get the opportunity to meet Robert Madavi. Um, he was at the point where he couldn't speak anymore. Um, so saying I met him is a little bit of a stretch, but I, I, shook his hand and patted him on the shoulder and, and gave him my regards. Um, but that was, that was, a quite an honor, uh, to, to meet him. And, um, 
you know, we have we have such a great wine community. I can't really name anyone else at this point because I'd have to name everybody. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. And only because we were talking about superheroes earlier. If you were a superhero, who would you be? You know, my, my daughter and I have been um, going through the, the Marvel series. Um, and, and so I, I actually know a fair amount of them. Um, I, I, I think I would I probably have to go with Black Panther. All right. Good answer. I love it. Yeah. Wakanda. All right. Well, I'm, uh, thank you so much for participating. You're out of the hot seat for now. Please but, make some uh, throw with... <laughs> I'm sorry? It's somebody else's turn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm actually going to throw it back to Jeff so he can talk about um, the beautiful Carignan bottling and the Cytone Zinfandel bottling. So, Jeff, why don't you uh, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Carly. All right. A couple a uh, couple of other fascinating wines that we make from uh, from Cytone. Um, 2018 was the first year that we made, uh, there's a, a couple acre block at the very front of the barn in that video uh, where the carignan uh, is planted. Um, and it's a couple of small blocks uh, planted 1895, just like the rest of the ranch. Um, carignan is kind of interesting. I mean, it, it comes from mostly, you know, it's planted a lot in the Southern uh, Rhone uh, uh, Valley, um, needs some heat. Um, you know, this particular site in the middle of the Russian River Valley in an area called the, the Santa Rosa Plain gets the heat that, that it needs, just like the Zinfandel, to, to fully ripen. Um, fascinating nose. This wine has, I mean, I wish you could really see the, the vibrance and the, and the color of this wine. Um, very vivid, red, um, intense, uh, again, almost that electric kind of look to it. Um, Lots of red fruits for as dark as, as it is, it just has this incredible red fruited character uh, to me, um, kind of highlighted with, or, you know, undertones of smoked meats and things like that. Definitely something on the earthy side. Um, kind of taking a page out of maybe the, the Southern Rhone uh, as well. Um, we do, I do age this wine in those demi moeds, the, the bigger size barrel, which is sort of traditional um, in, in that part of the world for a wine like this. And, you know, I feel like what it does is it preserves that beautiful fragrance, uh, in the, in the, you know, the aromatics, the floral, uh, really kind of preserves that freshness by using that type of barrel. Um, great structure as well. Carry on's typically, you know, got a, a, a good acid punch to it. Uh, it's a signature, a bit of a signature of Cytone, as I mentioned before. Um, but here it's like, it's juicy, it's red fruit, cranberries, all sorts of red fruits with, with hints of, hints of black fruit in there as well. Mark, what did you, you like this wine? It's pretty interesting. I, I love it. It's the, it, Fascinating. the structure of the wine kind of belies the fruit profile of it because in my mouth, I would think this was a, you know, a real a much darker fruited, but then, you know, it's, yeah. It's hard to follow your tasting notes because you name 20 things that you get and I get four of them. But, you know, the cranberry really stands out to me. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just that interesting uh, uh, combination of the, the fruit flavors and the structure making something really different. And, and again, it does uh, echo back to a lot of you know, the, the, the European Carignan, or, you know, I, I was telling somebody about this wine here and it was an old Sonoma County farmer. And they, they said, what, what did you call it? And I said, Carignan. And he said, you mean Carignan? Um, so, uh, hopefully it depends on where you are. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly for you. Yeah. Well, I've heard other versions of Carignan, like old time farmers called it Carignan also. Yeah. Um, yeah. It depends on what it's, part of Sonoma County you're in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, typically this would be a blender, right? I mean, in the Rhone Valley, it'd be blended with Grenache and Syrah and other components. But, you know, we have something special here, right? I mean, 120 plus year old vines, uh, they have very limited production per plant. Uh, in its youth, I mean, this may not have been a, a very interesting wine, I would say. In its youth, meaning 
when the vines were 10 or 12 years old. Uh, but as they've grown, um, you know, as they've gotten older, they're, they've limited the production. So the concentration is quite <clears throat> compelling, I think, in a wine like this. And, and again, you overlay that with the gentleness of, of a Pinot Noir winemaking house. Um, it really captures, I think, the best of the variety without being, you know, too heavy. So delicious Sandra. wine. Sandra, what's, uh, what's, what's your tasting note on this one? My uh, first nose on this, and I caught it when I opened these up uh, about an hour or so ago, and uh, that was espresso, which quickly turned into crushed violets that became blueberry. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's complexity. Um, yeah. But uh, again, to keep it simple, this, uh, as Jeff was pointing out, uh, does uh, grow a lot more in the Rhone area and Languedoc as well. A lot of folks have had Chateauneuf de Pop, so it's certainly a popular blending grape for that. But uh, originally it came from Espana. So how about we do some Manchengo cheese? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be perfect. Kind of the fat of, of, of that cheese would, would do pretty well with the tannin structure here. Mm -hmm. If you're going to keep talking about food, Sandra, you're going to have to bring some for us. I mean, <laughs> this is too hard to the hear all these demo. and not try any of them. People who I've hosted before know I'm just the big tease. So <laughs> one of these days we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, look forward to that. That'd be awesome. Um, okay, let's move on to the Zinfandel. Uh, so this is the 2019 Cytone uh, Zinfandel. Uh, so we've been making this since 2016 when we purchased the ranch. Um, and we slowly started to, you know, some of the grapes were still in contracts to other people. So we that's why we slowly introduced a lot of these other wines. 16 was the first year we made anything off the Cytone Ranch. And, you know, as you know, uh, hopefully everybody knows we make Zinfandel from a couple of other really outstanding vineyards, old vines. And this is such a unique expression. Um, you know, if you ever have the opportunity to open up multiple uh, of our wines, whether it's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, or Zinfandel, they each have their own signature. And to me, Cytone has this incredible, you know, there's, there's sort of crushed rocks kind of notes to it. Um, you know, I call it crunchy red fruits. You know, it's sort of a, a dark, you know, it's not in the black fruit category. It's not, you know, boysenberry and blackberry like some of our other Zinfandels. It has a just a, a very intense red fruit character to me. Um, spice, anise, things like that. Uh, it's very distinctive in, in our in our Zinfandel portfolio. Um, you know, very simple winemaking. You know, the uh, everything gets destemmed. Uh, we use our, our William Selium yeast and, you know, the foot treading and our dairy tank. So all that sort of, um, you know, typical for, for our winemaking. Uh, all French oak um, in, in these wines um, and only about 25% new oak. So not, 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 a, not a huge amount. There's a lot of complexity in, in these Zins and, and the, 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 the French oak, the 25% the just kind of helps support it. Um, and when I stick my nose in the glass, I, you know, everything is beautifully integrated. You get that crunchy red fruit character, the, 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 the minerality, uh, the citrus peel, that kind of thing. And the oak's not, not obtrusive uh, whatsoever. What a classic wine this wine is. I mean, I, I think this is, I mean, each year, you know, we hope to learn a little bit of, you know, something new about each of the vineyards or the, you know, fine tuning the winemaking. And I think this, to me, this is Kind of the pinnacle of, of what we've been able to do so far uh, with with Cytone, um, just the purity of fruit. What do you think, Sandra? You like it? Oh, I do. Uh, this oh, is a, so good. A beautiful wine. Um, you know, I think it's fascinating that here at William Selium for Zinfandel, we do use French oak, and typically that's not the case. It's American oak for most every other Zinfandel producers. Yeah. So when folks come here and they taste the wine, they go, I've never had a Zinfandel like this. And that's yeah. why that's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just, you know, the, the vineyard sourcing, obviously, you know, Cytone Ranch or any of our other Zinfandel sites, you know, they're in the Russian River Valley. They're going to naturally keep their beautiful freshness and acidity. And, and you know, again, kind of making the, 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 uh, the Zinfandels with a, a Pinot Noir mentality, you know, really showcases the varietal character. And um, these are such unique wines. Yeah, I love this. It's super food friendly wine, right? Because of that acid profile, Sandra? Absolutely. 
Um, and I think this, like all of your wines, uh, epitomize in one word your style, which is elegance. Yeah. But uh, yeah. back to the food thing, I think we need to do some baby back ribs with a double secret <laughs> rub and a boysenberry hoisin sauce, not a traditional barbecue sauce, and maybe punch up the spice a little bit with some cinnamon yam frites. How's that sound, Mark? That's, again, I'm, I'm super hungry already. Um, <laughs> You know, I did want to mention style because, you know, I think a lot of people that tuned in for this uh, webinar probably have had our Zins, but, you know, we are known as a Pinot Noir house. So some people may not have had our Zins before. And the thing that always amazes me is, um, you know, I, I used to, before I fell in love with Pinot, Zin was my, uh, my favorite uh, variety. And the difference when I first tried a William Selliam Zin was, you know, Zins are generally higher uh, in alcohol, um, you know, tannic, really very to the point of if they're overripe, they can be a little pruny. And ours are a complete different style from that. They're lighter, they're lower in alcohol. Generally, um, where our Pinots clock in, you know, from in the mid 13s to low 13s on average, up to 14.1, 14.2. Um, our Zins are in the low to mid 14s. I don't have a bottle hand handy, but if I recall, this is around 14.5% alcohol. And some of the bigger Zins are well above 15. And you get a stylistic um, difference because of that. You get a, uh, a lighter Zin in terms of the, the body of it. And it tends, our Zins tend to be more red fruited as Jeff has said a couple of times now. And it's a pretty Zin. It's not that kicking your head, you know, just bowled over with blackberry and yeah. um, you know, the, the, the oakiness of it and that high alcohol. And I think it's really refreshing as a Zin. Um, and Cytone has been, uh, uh, the Cytone Zin is almost a revelation because it is so different from the other Zins in our portfolio. And it quite, you know, no, no disrespect to the other three Zins, it, it is by far my favorite Zin that we make now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, it's it's a fun experiment to be able to try them side by side. And, you know, there's something, something for everybody, right, in our portfolio. D different styles, different acid structures, different tannin structures, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, just... Uh, you know, obviously the, you know, baby back ribs is, is great. This wine is so versatile. I mean, it can, you know, don't think of Zinfandel as just, yeah, pizza wine or anything like, you know, something simple and, you know, Tuesday night kind of wine. This is a really serious wine here, right? I mean, it can go with a lamb shank and, you know, braised lamb shank or, you know, braised uh, short ribs or something like that. That's a, you know, complex and, and intricate dish can totally handle it. Hmm. And they can also age, which um, I was at a place in the north end of Boston and they pulled out uh, an early 90s William Williams yeah. Zinn, made by Burt Williams. And you would mistake it for old Bordeaux. Um, and, uh, you know, our Zins can go very long like the Pinot Noirs. Although I think the... Um, they probably give you more pleasure younger, yeah. um, uh, but it's not, they, they can certainly age for the long term. Yeah. I don't really do that that much, but I do yeah. have a couple of stashed away for long term aging. Yeah, no, exactly. No, they're, they're built for, for age, but just like with so many of our wines, they have a very wide drinking window, right? I mean, it's that primary character, uh, young, and then the sort of secondary characters as the wines age. So Super exciting lineup of uh, wines from Cytone, I think. Excellent job, Jeff. Yeah. As always. Yeah. And, and this one, uh, the Zin that we're trying tonight, will be on the fall allocation. So the Cytone Estate Zin is not a winery-only wine. It does go in the broader release. So of the four, at least one of them is more, you don't have to come to the winery to get. Yeah, perfect. I'll turn it over to Carly. Carly? All right. On that note, thank you folks for an ask, answering some of the questions that we had in the chat. I know Ellen Boyd had asked about um, how long we should age our, our Cytones and Fendel. 
Uh, I know someone else asked about the, the alcohol percentage of Zinfandels. If anyone else has any questions, again, feel free to put those in the chat right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I have a question from Matthew Hartman. What are the aging potentials of our Chardonnays? Ooh. Uh, really, that should be a, a Jeff question, but since he's off camera, um, I feel that our Chardonnays can age almost, if not exactly as well as our Pinot Noirs. Um, but like Pinot Noir, you have to like what the Chardonnay turns into. Um, they tend to hold up really well for 10 years without, if they're stored properly, without even much loss of color. Um, but they do become a little softer at that point. Um, generally, I drink our Chardonnays in the three to five year window and then stash a few to see how much longer they'll go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to ask Jeff this question. Uh, we had a question earlier about uh, barrels. You know, do, are they coming from France, the U.S.? I know you briefly touched on this, uh, yeah. but could you give a little bit yeah, more uh, background on why we do yeah, absolutely. Um, so French oak is preferred. Uh, we uh, Chardonnays, Zinfandels, um, uh, Pinot Noirs are all uh, uh, from French oak. Um, Pinot Noirs in particular are Francois Ferrer. That's sort of a house uh, cooper, uh, barrel producer that we've used, that Bert was using back in the 80s. Um, so, uh, from a traditional perspective, we continue with those barrels, but with that said, they just offer, um, sort of a supporting role with the wines. Um, there's a lot of oak out there in the world, different styles, different, uh, toast levels, and really kind of married with the way that we make the wine, the Francois Frere is, is really the best fit. Um, we use a slightly different barrel, uh, French oak barrel for, uh, for the, uh, Zins, a uh, barrel called Terenso, um, which is typically a Cabernet styled barrel, um, but are uh, typically used in the Cabernet world, but it's, it can be quite elegant. It's certainly at the toast levels that we use. And then Chardonnays are um, a combination of Terenso and another, um, another Cooper uh, called Marcel Cadet. So yeah, there's really elegance in French oak. Once you start getting into say American or Hungarian oak, they're actually different species of oak that have um, very different aromatic properties uh, and very different tannin structures. And, and those kinds of things won't really um, mesh well with, with the style in which we make our wines. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And then I have another question from Dennis. Question. Uh, how would you describe the difference between the Bocchigalupi and the Cytones Infidels? Yeah. Um, so, but that's a very interesting comparison because um, both of those wines are pure Zinfandel, okay, in the field. We have the field blend from Cytone and we make that separately. You know, that's the Antonio's field blend. Um, so, you know, really what it comes down to, I mean, Bacigalupi is here on West Side Road. Um, both old vines, Bacigalupi is probably really a, a, a firm answer on it, but it's about 1920s. Uh, for the bocce zin. Um, and, you know, stylistically, the bocce is a little more, way more elegant. It's less acid focused uh, than the cytone. To me, it has um, the bocce, uh, bocce galupi typically is like, how do I describe it? Fruit bowl. You know, it has like these blueberries, red fruits, black fruits, all those things kind of jumbled together in, in the glass as where we really have, as we talked about in Cytone, that really crunchy, more acid focused red fruit, cranberries and, you know, all sorts of like red fruit character. So super different wines. I do want to point out, just like we do with the Pinot Noirs, all the Zins are made in the same fashion. So it's, you know, when you do get a chance to taste all the, the Zinfandel side by side, there is sort of a, a, a commonality in how the wines are crafted um, to exactly that highlight the place and the uniqueness of the vineyards. So do we do any whole cluster on these bottlings? Nope. Uh, Zinfandel is typically, um, uh, all whole berry, uh, as where Pinot Noir, uh, we want a little bit of that whole cluster. And again, sort of the, the rachis, the stem of Zinfandel can be a little bit uneven in its ripeness level. Uh, so that can, sort of add, be more of a detriment to the texture of the wine as opposed to 
um, kind of helping it out like like it does in Pinot Noir. All right. I have a question for uh, I have a question for Mark. We've had a few comments on um, either how to get these wines or um, you know why we have our estate uh, winery wine program. If you want to talk a little bit about that, um, sure. maybe answer some of those questions. So um, you know, obviously. It, it depends on where you are in the country. It's harder to come here, and I get that. And I'll, I'll uh, hopefully I can address that. The reason we do this is because we do sell out of our wines, so we need something for when people come to visit to um, taste and to buy. Um, you know, I've I've been with William Selliam for uh, I'm on my 16th year now, and I remember when I first started at the down at the Allen Vineyard in the old uh, trailer that people would become incensed that they couldn't buy anything. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't much of a tour back then. And, you know, you're standing out sometimes in the muddy vineyard talking about the process and then they'd want to buy something, even a single bottle, and we weren't able to do that. So when we built this winery and opened it in 2010, um, one of the, uh, the part of our planning in it was to have wine available for people to buy when they come and visit. But uh, so we make wine of, uh, about, it's eight or nine, what we call winery only wines now. Um, uh, there's a three or two from the estate here, um, uh, one from our Drake estate, these Cytone wines, and our three sisters Chardonnay from uh, the Martinelli family's vineyard. And the problem with it is, of all these bottlings, we only make a little bit of each one. So I think the Carignan is around a hundred cases, uh, somewhere like that. And it's just almost impossible to put on an allocation. So we tend to uh, not publicize them as much, but people have found out about the different wines we make. Um, you know, I mentioned Chenin Blanc earlier. And when we do release those wines, um, we keep up, kind of a list within a list, for lack of a better term, for people who have said, I really want the Chenin Blanc. And if they're not able to come, we are able to ship those wines. We just make them in such small amounts. We don't really talk about it that much. Now, of course, this video is preserved on YouTube forever. So, um, uh, but we're in uh, minute 56. So if you stayed this long, you're able to find out. So you can contact the winery. We are able to sell you these wines outside of just coming here to visit. But the purpose of it is when you do come and visit, we have something special that um, maybe you haven't tried before that you can taste and also buy. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Mark. Um, so if anyone, we tried to do our best to answer as many of the questions that you, you asked us today. If anyone has any additional questions or would like any additional information about these wines, you're always more than welcome to email us at tours at williamscellium.com, which is also where you can inquire about if you happen to be out in wine country and want to come visit the beautiful Cytona estate. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined us here today. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to my, my, my co-hosts, Mark and Sandrew, and we have Jeff as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, the Cytone Vineyard, and I hope everyone uh, who's able to can come out and, and, and really just immerse themselves in the history uh, that is at that vineyard. So again, thank you so much, everyone who joined us today and cheers. And we hope to see you out here soon and hope to have some, uh, some wine in your hands. Salté. <laughs> chin chin.